I'm a Stranger Here Myself by Mac Reynolds. This story was first published in Amazing Stories, December 1960. The Place de France is the town's hub. It marks the end of Boulevard Pasteur, the main drag of the westernized part of the city, and the beginning of Rue de la Liberté, which leads down to the Grand Soco and the Medina. In a three-minute walk from the Place de France, you can go from an ultra-modern, California-like resort to the Baghdad of Harun al-Rashid. It's quite a town, Tangier. King-size sidewalk cafes occupy three of the strategic corners on the Place de France. The Café de Paris serves the best draft beer in town, gets all the better custom, and has three shoeshine boys attached to the establishment. You can sit of a sunny morning and read the Paris edition of the New York Herald Tribune while getting your shoes done up like mirrors for thirty Moroccan francs, which comes to about five cents at current exchange. You can sit there, after the paper's read, sip your espresso, and watch the people go by. Tangier is possibly the most cosmopolitan city in the world. In native costume, you'll see Berber and Reef, Arab and Blue Man, and occasionally a Singalese from further south. In European dress, you'll see Japs and Chinese, Hindus and Turks, Levantines and Filipinos, North Americans and South Americans, and, of course, even Europeans, from both sides of the curtain. In Tangier you'll find some of the world's poorest and some of the richest. The poorest will try to sell you anything from a shoe shine to their not very lily white bodies, and the richest will avoid your eyes, afraid you might try to sell them something. In spite of recent changes, the town still has its unique qualities. As a result of them, the permanent population includes smugglers and black marketeers fugitives from justice and international conmen, espionage and counter-espionage agents, homosexuals, nymphomaniacs, alcoholics, drug addicts, displaced persons, ex-royalty and subversives of every flavor. Local law limits the activities of few of these. Like I said, it's quite a town. I looked up from my Herald Tribune and said, Hello, Paul. Anything new cooking? He sank into the chair opposite me and looked around for the waiter. The tables were all crowded, and since mine was a face he recognized, he assumed he was welcome to intrude. It was more or less standard procedure at the Café de Paris. It wasn't a place to go if you wanted to be alone. Paul said, How are you, Rupert? Haven't seen you for a donkey's years. The waiter came along, and Paul ordered a glass of beer. Paul was an easy-going, sallow-faced little man. I vaguely remembered somebody saying he was from Liverpool and in exports. "'What's in the newspaper?' he said disinterestedly. "'Pogo and Albert are going to fight a duel,' I told him. "'And little Abner is becoming a rock-and-roll singer.' He grunted. Oh, I said, the intellectual type. I scanned the front page. The Ruskies have put up another man's satellite. They have, eh? How big? Several times bigger than anything we Americans have. The beer came and looked good, so I ordered a glass, too. Paul said, Whatever happened to those poxy flying saucers? What flying saucers? A French girl went by with a poodle, so finely clipped as to look as though it had been shaven. The girl was in the latest from Paris, every pore in place. We both looked after her. You know, what everybody was seeing a few years ago. It's too bad one of these bloody man satellites wasn't up then. Maybe they would have seen one. That's an idea, I said. We didn't say anything else for a while, and I began to wonder if I could go back to my paper without rubbing him the wrong way. 
I don't know Paul very well, but for that matter it's comparatively seldom you ever get to know anybody very well in Tangier. Largely, cards are played close to the chest. My beer came, and a plate of tapas for us both. Tapas at the Café de Paris are apt to be potato salad, a few anchovies, olives, and possibly some cheese. Free lunch, they used to call it in the States. Just to say something, I said, Where do you think they come from? And when he looked blank, I added, The flying saucers. He grinned. From Mars or Venus or someplace. Hmm, I said. Too bad none of them ever crashed or landed on the Yale football field and said, Take me to your cheerleader or something. Paul yawned and said, That was always the trouble with those crackpot blokes' explanations of them. If they were aliens from space, then why not show themselves? I ate one of the potato chips. It had been cooked in rancid olive oil. I said, Oh, there are various answers to that one. We could probably sit around here and think of two or three that made sense. Paul was mildly interested. Like what? Well, hell, suppose, for instance, there's this uh, big galactic league of civilized planets. But it's restricted, see? You're not eligible for membership until you, well, say until you've developed spaceflight. Then you're invited into the club. Meanwhile, they send secret missions down from time to time to keep an eye on your progress. Paul grinned at me. <laughs> I see you read the same poxy stuff I do. A Moorish girl went by, dressed in a neatly tailored gray jalaba, European-style high-heeled shoes, and a pinkish silk veil, so transparent that you could see she wore lipstick. Very provocative dark eyes can be over a veil. We both looked after her. I said, Oh, here's another one. Suppose you have a very advanced civilization on, oh, say, Mars. Not Mars. No air and too bloody dry to support life. Don't interrupt, please, I said with mock severity. This is a very old civilization, and as the planet began to lose its water and air, it withdrew underground. Uses hydroponics and so forth. Husbands its water and air. Isn't that what we do in a few million years if Earth lost its water and air? I suppose so, he said. Anyway, what about them? Well, they observe how man is going through a scientific boom, an industrial boom, a population boom, a boom, period. Any day now he's going to have practical spaceships. Meanwhile, he's also got the H-bomb, and the way he beats the drums on both sides of the curtain, he's not against using it, if he could get away with it. Paul said, I got it. So they're scared and are keeping an eye on us. That's an old one. I've read that a dozen times, dished up different. I shifted my shoulders. Well, it's one possibility. I got a better one. How's this? There's this alien life form that's way ahead of us. Their civilization is so old that they don't have any records of when it began and how it was in the early days. They've gone beyond things like wars and depressions and revolutions and greed for power or any of these things giving us a bad time here on Earth. They're all like scholars, get it? And some of them are jolly well taken by Earth, especially the way we are right now with all the problems, get it? Things developing so fast we don't know where we're going or how we're going to get there. I finished my beer and clapped my hands for Muli. How do you mean, where we're going? Well, take half the countries in the world today. They're trying to industrialize, modernize, catch up with the advanced countries. Look at Egypt and Israel and India and China and Yugoslavia and Brazil and all the rest. Trying to drag themselves up to the level of the advanced countries and all using different methods of doing it. But look at the so-called advanced countries, <laughs> up to their bottoms and problems, juvenile delinquents, climbing crime and suicide rates, the loony bins full of the balmy, unemployed, threat of war, sp 
spending all their money on armaments instead of things like schools. All the bloody mess of it. Why, a man from Mars would be fascinated like. Mooley came shuffling up in his babouche slippers, and we both ordered another schooner of beer. Paul said seriously, You know, there's only one big snag in this sort of talk. I've sorted the whole thing out before, and you always come up against this brick wall. Where are they, these observers, or scholars, or spies, or whatever they are? Sooner or later we'd nab one of them. You know, Scotland Yard, or the FBI, or Russia's secret police, or the French Sûreté, or Interpol. This world is so deep in police, counter-espionage outfits, and security agents that an agent would slip up in time, no matter how much he'd been trained. Sooner or later he'd slip up and they'd nab him. I shook my head. Not necessarily. The first time I ever considered this possibility it seemed to me that such an alien would base himself in London or New York somewhere where he could use the libraries for research, get the daily newspapers and the magazines, be right in the center of things. But now I don't think so. I think he'd be right here in Tangier. Why Tangier? It's the one town in the world where anything goes. Nobody gives a damn about you or your affairs. For instance, I've known you a year or more now and I haven't the slightest idea of how you make your living." "'That's right,' Paul admitted. "'In this town you seldom ever ask a man where he's from. He can be British, a white Russian, a Basque, a Sikh, and nobody could care less. Where are you from, Rupert?' "'California,' I told him. "'No, you're not,' he grinned. I was taken aback. "'What do you mean?' I felt your mind probe back a few minutes ago when I was talking about Scotland Yard or the FBI possibly flushing an alien. Telepathy is a sense not trained by the humanoids. If they had it, your job and mine would be considerably more difficult. <laughs> Let's face it, in spite of these human bodies we're disguised in, neither of us is humanoid. Where are you really from, Rupert? Aldebaran, I said. How about you? Deneb, he told me, shaking. We had a laugh and ordered another beer. What are you doing here on Earth? I asked him. Researching for one of our meat trusts. We're protein eaters. Humanoid flesh is considered quite a delicacy. How about you? Scouting the place for thrill tourists. My job is to go around to these backward cultures and help stir up intertribal or international conflicts, all according to how advanced they are. Then our tourists come in, well shielded, of course, and get their kicks watching it." Paul frowned. That sort of practice could spoil an awful lot of good meat. End of I'm a Stranger Here Myself